Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we will talk about the first box to be released for the new Scandinavian sub-faction of the Imperium and that was the Ragnarok Battlefleet. We will also talk a little bit about the Scandinavian Frontline Squadron, which is basically the same box but without the Ragnarok flagship. Before we analyze the box, let's talk for a second about the Scandinavian playstyle. First thing that you will notice about them is that they are fast. They are really fast for their sizes. Usually, they each of them have the hammer sweep rule to go even faster. And uh, yeah, they're just extremely agile and fast. That is good because most of their weaponry is best when used at point blank range. They have a lot of the best point blank weapons of the Imperium, such as the Stormclaw, Heavy Stormclaw, or the, even the Stormbringers and that means that they really want to get close. They also want to get close because they are great at boarding actions. Uh, they have already high fray values, uh, some of them have fury generators, and uh, yeah, they are just extremely good at boarding enemy ship, which goes well with uh, their point-blank weaponries. Uh, you can really think of them as uh, steampunk vikings uh, in their playstyle, and that is quite cool. However, their ships are not as tough as themselves and they will crumble and sink fast if they get focused by any sort of determined firepower. So you really will need to hide them or find some tricks uh, in order to reach a boarding range uh, without losing too many ships in the process while crossing the seas. So what do you actually get in this box? In the Ragnarok battle fleet, you get obviously the namesake, the Ragnarok Heavy River. You also get two Scandinavian frontline cruisers, which you can build as either the Gungnir, the Odin, or the Jotun. And you get uh, four of the Hoth heavy corvettes. Uh, now, the Scandinavian frontline uh, box is basically the same, just uh, without the Ragnarok Heavy River. If you do plan to play Scandinavians, I would highly recommend to get at the same time the Ragnarok Battlefleet for 44 pounds, so about 50 euros, and the Scandinavian Frontline for 26 pounds, so 32 euros, I guess, something like this. And this gives you your flagship, the Ragnarok. It will give you four Scandinavian Frontline cruisers, which is a healthy amount because you do want quite a few versions of this, and you get eight Hoth Heavy Corvettes, which are very good ships that can be used as escorts or as a huge pack to do a lot of damage, as we will see in a minute. And this is quite a few points, and it's a really offensive, aggressive fleet, and a lot of uh, fun to play. So let's talk about the Ragnarok. Um, first thing that I want to say is that in the latest update of the Orbat for the Imperium, the old Scandinavian battle fleet that gave you additional movement on the first turn is gone. Now you have the Scandinavian Reaver battle fleet, uh, which requires the Ragnarok as a flagship, or the Asgard and the or the Valhalla, which are two ships, the Asgard and the Valhalla, which are not released yet. Then you need one uh, surface Scandinavian ship. It does not have to be the Gungnir anymore, it can be any surface ship, um, though you can have multiple Gungnirs and Hoth. You can have up to three of these surface ships, and you can have up to two submerged Scandinavian ships and one aerial Scandinavian unit. Uh, do note that the submerged and aerial Scandinavian units are not yet available, um, even though they should come early in 2023, I guess, because uh, some of those are already in the orbits. I'm especially looking forward for the rotor aircrafts of the Scandinavians. What do you get if you make this battle fleet? You don't have this bonus movement on the first turn, but you get Valorous Conduct, which is a quite powerful uh, rule that allows you once per turn, when you make a Valor uh, effect on one of your ship, to have the value of this Valor effect being at 50 instead, instead of uh, whatever is uh, written on the card. That is good because then it makes the life very difficult for your opponent to try to counter it. It's especially good if you want to uh, make uh, heavy firepower, uh, for example, on the Ragnarok, even though the Ragnarok only has two main weapons and it cannot link with its third weapon, which is the Stormbringer. So uh, Valorous Conduct is fine, I guess, but not the best fleet to have it on. 
Though, uh, the Ragnarok is a very good ship, even if its Scandinavian River battle fleet is not that great, because it is, first of all, a very fast ship. Uh, effectively, if you go straight, it goes 12 inches uh, per turn, uh, because it has a big mass, it has a good speed of 7, it has a Fury Generator boosting its speed, and it can do a Hammer Sweep if it goes straight. So, that is a fast ship. However, it is not that resilient. It does have a good armor value at 8, but its citadel is at 14, which means that if there is any amount of dedicated firepower, it will get a critical relatively easily compared to other um, ships, or other sh mass 3 ships, and uh, it can get a catastrophic explosion by doubling the citadel value. Uh, relatively easily. It's going to be at 28 hits for a critical uh, explosion uh, instead of, for example, 32 for most of the other uh, Mass 3 uh, frontline battleships. It also only has 11 hull points in total. That is quite on the low end for a ship that wants to be at point blank. What it does have, though, for itself, it's, it has good uh, values of ADV and SDV, which means, again, it will not lose that much damage for volley of torpedoes or of rockets. So, yeah, the theme here is that uh, if your enemy tries to shoot at the Ragnarok with small arms, it will bounce off, relatively speaking. Uh, however, if your enemy focuses the Ragnarok with big battleships or big unit uh, of powerful cruisers, the Ragnarok will go down fast. All this means that this Ragnarok will be a major distraction for your enemy, uh, because uh, it will require a lot of firepower to sink relatively. Uh, it's not a tank uh, for 233 points, but it is very good for absorbing the firepower that would otherwise be directed at the rest of your Scandinavian fleet, which is even more fragile for the cost. The Ragnarok is relatively fragile for its point cost, but your other ships that we'll see in a mo moment are very fragile for their point cost. Uh, and your enemy has to deal with the Ragnarok, because if it does get at point blank, then oh boy, does he bring the pain. It has a Stormbringer, which is 12 dice with devastating arc and sustained. Uh, if you play the game, I don't need to tell you how efficient it is, but if you are new, let me tell you that this will get a critical damage on basically any ship it targets, uh, no matter how big. And it can reach a catastrophic explosion, so twice the Citadel, on anything but the... Uh, heaviest uh, cruisers uh, quite regularly. So it, at point blank, just the Stormbringer will bring the pain. It also had these cannons, so that is fine. What also goes in its favor is that at uh, point blank, it will probably be able to use its fray value, and its fray value is great. It will do a lot of boarding. Uh, almost all of the Scandinavian ships have uh, aggressive crew, meaning that they reroll blanks on boarding actions. So yeah, it's basically the theme. like get close, uh, board the enemy, and uh, like, yeah, drink their tears. Uh, that's the whole theme. And the very nice thing about the Ragnarok, still going with this idea that it's a distraction piece, is that it keeps all of its firepower, even if it's crippled. So it will uh, keep firing its Stormbringer and all its weaponry uh, at their battle-ready profile until it is sunk, that is very well. And also, its free value does not go down when it's crippled, it actually goes up. It's the rule called uh, Revel in Chaos. And uh, yeah, basically your Vikings are just abandoning ship and going all of them on the enemy ship. Uh, that's how I imagine it and they are extremely efficient all the way until the ship is sunk. So your enemy cannot just put a few points of damage there and think, okay, I'll cripple it and then I can focus on the real threat. No, 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 it has, it has to sink your Ragnarok before it can take care of the rest. And that makes it a really good distraction and a, like I would call it a distraction carnifex in other games uh, because it's not that expensive, uh, it will be threatening all the way until the end and if your enemy does not handle the Ragnarok at point blank, oh, it will do a lot of damage. Now that we've seen this uh, shield for your Scandinavian fleet, let's have a look at the frontline cruisers. You have three variants. You have the Gungnir, the Odin and the Jotun. The Gungnir is not mandatory anymore for building a Scandinavian battle fleet, as we've seen, but it's still a good ship. Uh, it costs only 72 points, which is relatively cheap, and it can bring a heavy storm cloud and a storm cloud, which is like quite decent for a ship 
at uh, that price range. Uh, that's going to be 10 dices, devastating and arc, meaning that, for example, they ignore shield generators. So for 72 points, you have a ship that can really pack a punch if it gets at point blank. And uh, it is fragile, though, that's going to be the theme here. It has low armor, uh, a very average citadel, and a uh, few uh, hull points. So it will get uh, sunk fast if your enemy starts to focus its attention on it. Uh, however, it is quite cheap. It is also very agile. It has power slide, meaning that it can start to do its turning move, uh, action while it is drifting. And uh, yeah, overall, just a, a good small ship. Then you have the Odin. The Odin is much more expensive at 92 points. Uh, it does not have the small storm cloud, but it has a heavy gun battery instead. Good. And the rule that really makes it worth it is that it has Vanguard. Vanguard means that you can make a move of up to 5 inches uh, just before the first turn begins. And we've been saying uh, quite a lot already that uh, Scandinavian ships are great at point blank, but they are fragile. So I don't need to explain to you why it is good to be able to make a 5 inch movement even the, uh, before the game begins. It gets you closer to where you want to be before your enemy has a chance to start shooting at you. There is a little trick that we'll talk at the end um, to kind of like circumvent the weakness of the Scandinavians. But if you don't use this trick, then I would recommend having one or two Odin to grab the objectives early and uh, yeah, to just threaten the enemy. Uh, also note that I would best use them with Vanguard on the flanks. Uh, because if you do put them in the middle of the table, your enemy will see this fragile threatening ship already just in front of him and he will focus him down. Like, straight away like it will not leave the odin will not leave past the half of the first turn if you just drop it in the middle with vanguard so be careful with that one thing you can do if you really want to use them as uh, carriers of stormcloud is to give them to give them shield generators uh, it first of all it makes them cheaper at 82 points good and then you have this 82 points uh storm ring uh, sorry stormcloud that is has a vanguard and has a defensive sh uh, generator for example shroud or shield and then yeah it is not as fragile anymore and that is how i would play the odin with a generator to make it more tanky and on the flank so it, your enemy really has better pr firing prior priorities than the odin finally you have the yotun i just love this model well i love all of these models to be fair but this one has it all it has a storm cloud here it has a no, sorry, this is the small storm cloud, this is a heavy storm cloud, and this is a heavy gun battery that you can replace as well. And uh, it, it is pricey, it is really pricey for, uh, and for what it brings. It is very fragile. However, yeah, just look at all these weapons. If this Yotun gets in point blank range of anything, uh, this thing is gonna have a bad day. Like with all these point blank weaponries, the high fray value, it has good broadside. I mean, the, uh, it is very powerful. Um, how I would play the Yotun is as a Death Star unit, as, a, as we sometimes say. Uh, you can pack three of those, and as we will see uh, just in a minute, there are ways to even boost further their firepower by uh, attaching some units. And if you do that, you have your main damage dealer of the Scandinavians. Uh, this thing can really be a threat, but again, lots of ships together it's gonna really there this unit of three yotuns if you play them like this is gonna have a huge target on their head and the enemy will want to focus it fast and they will probably not be in range uh, of their maximum firepower on turn one so yeah they need a little bit of uh, subtle hand to be played if you do want to make the most of them for those, um, you can also, as we said for the Odin, give them a shield generator because their main firepower comes from this uh, Stormbringer and the Stormclaw. Or you could keep the heavy gun batteries. One rule that the Jotun has and that the others don't is focused gunnery, giving them two additional dices for one um, attack with the gunnery key, uh, keyword. For uh, Heavy gun batteries do have this keyword and so do the Stormclaw. Which means that if you do keep the heavy gun battery, turn one, you should be in range, uh, at least long range, to make uh, some attack to soften your target. And then when you get at uh, closing range, point blank range, you can use the focused gunnery to boost your electrical stormcloud attacks. 
Also in these boxes, you get Hoth Heavy Corvettes. Those are very, very powerful Mass 1 ships, but they are extremely fragile. They have only 4 as a value of armor and 10 as citadel which means that anything points their gun at them uh, will have a real chance at sinking them in one go. However, each and every single one of them packs a storm cloud, which is huge for such small ships. At 33 points per ship, they are expensive, uh, especially when compared to their armor value, but once they get at point blank range, they are devastating. There are two main ways I see uh, how to play them. First of all, you can attach them to any Scandinavian unit, uh, which means not only flagships. And one very uh, convenient way to use them and powerful would be to attach two Hoth heavy corvettes to a pack of three Jotuns. First of all, their storm clouds can all link together to make one really devastating attack. And second of all, that is a very threatening pack and uh, Hopefully the Yotuns will absorb some of the firepower that could be dedicated to the Hoth because they are more threatening, uh, allowing your Hoth to get closer to the enemy without being sunk and uh, vice versa. If your enemy points their big guns at the Hoth, then it's al always uh, this that will not be aimed at your Yotuns. So that is a very powerful pack that you can send at the enemy or you can have up to six Hoths in a single unit and uh, this uh, is very fragile, so best to use it on the flanks uh, or behind uh, terrain, for example. But again, six Hoths, once they get in point blank range, first of all, they are devastating with all their storm clouds. And uh, second of all, they are quite good at boarding. Like all of them uh, have an insane value of fray, six Hoths, if you manage to board uh, the same ship all at once. And yeah, you can even try boarding battleships with uh, this uh, value. Uh, do note that if you pack uh, six Hoths together and your enemy has uh, blast templates, such as the Borodino's uh, Cryoblast Generator, uh, then be careful and spread out. Otherwise, uh, weapons such as the Borodino's Cryoblast can wipe out an entire unit just in one activation with just this weapon. So be very careful. If your enemy has blast, you will try to point it at Hoth. So space them out and don't get them all together conveniently uh, in range of a blast. Now let's have a look at two lists if you want to play pure Scandinavian. Uh, the first is if you just want to dip your toes into the Scandinavian playstyle. Uh, this implies buying a single Ragnarok box and a single Scandinavian frontline box, so quite cheap um, still. Uh, for 750 points you can have the Ragnarok as uh, your flagship one Gungnir with a Volt gun battery, uh, more likely played like in the rear because it has a better range, uh, but still you can put it upward towards the objective, it still can be played aggressively. Then your main damage dealers, uh, two Gungnir with Stormclaw and two Hoth attached, uh, all of them can link their Stormclaws together, uh, they will be uh, powerful, uh, especially at point blank range, I recommend putting them behind the Ragnarok so the Ragnarok does uh, attract all the incoming firepower. And then a single pack of six Hoths. Uh, again, your secondary uh, damage dealer. Uh, quite a bit more fragile, especially against Blast. Uh, you can either put it on the flank or put everything down the center. Depending on your opponent and the scenario, of course. Uh, this is quite fun to play. You don't have that many activations. But it's still like it, it is going to be very fun to play for you or your opponent. Also very fun to play is this list for at uh, 1500 points. It involves uh, having in total two Ragnarok boxes and one uh, Scandinavian frontline uh, box. So not that much more expensive actually than this uh, list just before. Uh, you have two battle fleets, each of them led by Ragnarok with escorts, because at 1500 points uh, your enemy will start to have a lot of torpedoes or rockets or whatever, uh, depending on what they have, or SRS token, etc. And your Ragnaroks uh, being your only tank, and I use it with quotation marks, tank, uh, will need escorts to try to survive a little bit longer. And then you have two uh, Gungnirs with Storm Clouds. I like these little cheap, very fast uh, activation. Uh, Storm Clouds still do a lot of damage at point blank range. And uh, yeah, it allows you to play the activation game against your opponent because it's a real threat to be out activated. One Odin with a Volt Gun battery. 
a uh, heavy Volgan battery, by the way. Uh, this is good to go on the flank with uh, Vanguard. Again, a quite cheap activation to threaten the flanks, and it's always good to have these small ships. And then a pack of three Yotuns with Storm Clouds. Uh, those are really gonna be your main damage dealer. Three Yotuns is no joke. Uh, however, be careful, uh, they are relatively fragile. So again, while the rest of your ships gain some time with their small activation or tank uh, the enemy firepower, you can put your Yotuns up the board and try to do real damage. Real damage that can also be done by two packs of six Hoth Heavy Corvettes. Again, extremely fragile, spread them out or put them behind, behind terrain, etc. Turn 2, when you start to be at point blank, these things will really uh, pull their weight. That is a very fun list that you can play at 1500 points. I'm not sure it is the most competitive list you could bring to a tournament, for example, but it's going to be so fun to play. Just have all these ships that want to just rush at the enemy, and they will cross the map trying to do that, and it feels a little bit like, I don't know, playing Orcs or, I don't know, Tyranids from Warhammer. You will just run at the enemy and try to bore them and shoot them at point blank. It's just going to be fun. I'm not guaranteeing you're going to win, but you will for sure learn a lot about movement, hiding behind terrain, which is a quite difficult skill uh, to get in this game, uh, and it will just be fun. Your enemy will just try to hold the line and you will rush at him. It is going to be a very one of the most fun you can have with uh, a list, uh, in my opinion. Um, not the most competitive, though. If you want to be competitive, a little extra slide. Uh, I would recommend playing Scandinavians in a combined Imperial battle force. Um, me, why, why would you do that? There is a very specific uh, battle force, uh, battle fleet, sorry, that is the Imperium battle fleet, allowing you to bring a little bit of uh, everything from any uh, Imperium nation, including Scandinavian. So, uh, what you lose, since you don't have uh, the um, Scandinavian river battle fleet, you lose Valorous Conduct, which is um, not so bad, because there are not many Valor action that you would like to use uh, on your ships, especially like heavy firepower, since even your Ragnarok only has two heavy gun batteries that you can link. So losing Valorous Conduct is eh, fine. However, what you do gain, uh, if it is your second battle fleet and not your first, be careful, if it is your second battle fleet, then this Imperium battle fleet will uh, automate, like has to be in reserve, it has to be in reserve, but it can automatically come from reserve uh, starting on turn two. Uh, it's considered being a heavy hit, so you cannot come from the enemy's uh, side of the table, but you can come from the other three side of the table. And let's remember that when you arrive from reserve, you can drift, you can move, you can <laughs> shoot, board, ram, you can do everything. So that is extremely good, uh, because the main uh, weakness of the Scandinavians is that they're very vulnerable on the first turn. When they cannot use their firepower, they cannot use their boarding, and they're just very fragile. With this, it is really powerful because you will completely cancel the threat on the first turn. You can have another fleet. Uh, this absolutely can, you can do with two Scandinavian fleet, one being in uh, uh, Scandinavian rivers and one being in Imperium battle fleet. Uh, that can work. For example, this fleet would be more uh, efficient if you want to not play like pure Scandinavian, but playing one of them as an Imperium battle fleet. And um, yeah, it's uh, really powerful, especially when you start to put some very tanky Imperium uh, units to hold the line, uh, hold, waiting for turn 2 when your Scandinavians can come and do a lot of mayhem. Uh, here we'll start by describing this Imperium battle fleet. It's most of your points. There is the Ragnarok to lead them, of course. There is this absolute Death Star of three Yotuns with Storm Clouds with two Heavy Corvettes attached. That's a lot of points, but damn, this thing is going to delete <laughs> something the turn it arrives, like really. Plus it can board very efficiently, and you really you skip this uh, first turn threat of like just crossing the board and taking a lot of damage. This, you will uh, reach an enemy to board uh, on the second turn when you arrive. And then a little pack of six Hoth. Uh, again, very fragile, but if you can just make it pop next to an enemy uh, from reserve, uh, then great, great. You, you can just uh, skip the suffering part and uh, go straight to the dealing damage part, which is great. And what I think would do great uh, as a support is a Prussian support battle fleet with an Ice Maiden, uh, with a little escort because you, I had some points, and uh, you have one mandatory surface unit. Why not put a Blotcher with heavy shock rocket batteries? Uh, you can attach it to the Ice Maiden to really have a solid uh, first turn against enemy torpedoes and stuff. 
the Ice Maiden, the basic Ice Maiden, is very good in this uh, fleet because you can put it just at the center of the table. And what you are saying at your enemy uh, by doing that is saying, okay, first turn, first of all, I'm going to send you a lot of bombers and fighters, etc. because it is an aircraft carrier. Uh, I don't have a lot of long-range weaponry, but my Ice Maiden is right in the center of the table. If you stay uh, on the side of the table trying to evade me, uh, then on the second turn all my Scandinavians will come and ram you and board you, etc. And kill you with strong clothes, like it's really a threat. Or if you, if uh, you, my opponent, wants to stay in the center of the table to avoid being boarded on the uh, second turn, well then... Uh, it's a bad time to be you because then you will be in range of my Ice Maiden, which has three Stormbringers, which are very uh, short range weaponry. But if your uh, opponent uh, stays away from the side of the table to not be boarded, then it will be right in front of your Ice Maiden for turn two, turn three, etc. So, yeah, uh, your enemy will have a very difficult first turn. Uh, he will almost only play him by himself because you have one activation. But damn, is it going to be a difficult first turn for him because he will have to anticipate the second turn. Uh, to be fair, this fleet is extremely competitive, I think, and I have no idea how I would handle it as, a, as an opposing player. Uh, it's very difficult. Don't do this to your friend if it's their first game of uh, Dystopian Wars. But yeah, this is really uh, using the best of both worlds. Uh, the Ice Maiden's capacity for long-range token play and uh, uh, short-range control of the middle of the tables. And the Scandinavians just coming from the side and doing what they do best. This is a very good list if you want to start to be a little bit more competitive in Dystopian Wars. And that's it. That is uh, all there is to say, all I have to say uh, for now about the Scandinavians. Really looking forward for the new models that will come uh, relatively soon. We've seen uh, some concept art for the Asgard, especially their aircraft carrier. There is going to be the Valhalla uh, fast dreadnought that looks incredible from its tight lines. And of course, I'm waiting for the uh, Valkyrie uh, rotorcraft, which if it looks half as good as the British rotorcrafts, it will be amazing. Um, uh, it's really a fun faction to play, we've seen why. It is fragile, um, you might lose uh, quite a lot if you make some mistakes, but again, it's very good to learn the game, because at point blank they are devastating, and it will teach you uh, something very important, which is how to hide your ship, and how to minimize uh, enemy fire uh, power uh, while you're closing the gap. This is a skill that is very important for a lot of armies, for the French, for, for a lot of armies, they want to be at point blank range, the Chinese as well. Uh, and this is the best faction to start to learn this uh, skill. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give us a thumbs up. It really helped. Uh, tell us in the comments uh, which uh, box you would like me to cover next about what to build with it. And uh, if you are not a subscriber yet, well, then uh, you can subscribe so you're sure to see our latest uh, battle report, box analysis, unboxing, etc. Thank you very much for watching up until the end, and until the next video, keep spreading the love around you. Bisous!